This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. Good morning, and please be seated. Let us begin with prayer. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts that we may truly see you as you really are, revealed through your word in the power of the Holy Spirit and celebrated among your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our readings this morning are about spiritual vision. And with spiritual vision in mind, first we will look at Stephen, and then at the man first called Saul, and then we will look at ourselves and consider how we approach the entire concept of spiritual vision. Our Gospel reading sets the tone this morning for us when it comes to spiritual vision. If you know me, said Jesus, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, John's Gospel says this in another place. No one has seen God. The only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. So what does this mean when Jesus says, You have seen Him? <coughs> Spiritual vision, according to Jesus, is about both knowing and seeing. Knowledge is not enough. God must open our eyes of faith to see. Stephen, the first martyr of the church knew a lot, and he could see. Saul knew a lot, but at the time of Stephen, he could not see. What about us this morning? We might know a lot about the Bible, the Christian faith, many other things in this world, but can we see with the eyes of the heart by faith? That's the question before us. And we will explore together according to God's word. Let's begin with Stephen. Stephen had been a, one of seven deacons appointed by the apostles in the early church to serve. Yet there was something special about Stephen. He also knew a great amount about biblical history, and he was quite a preacher. He was opposed by the religious authorities, and so was brought before them to answer their charges. And how did he respond? By giving them a very lengthy sermon, which you can read about in the book of Acts. It's quite something. That was his defense to preach the gospel according to God's word. And the gist of the sermon was that time and time again, the people of God had rejected the new things that God was doing, ultimately found in the rejection of Jesus Christ. Now, do you think they were pleased to hear this eloquent sermon? Not at all. They took great offense. They knew a lot. They probably thought they knew more than Stephen. But they couldn't see. They could not see. As soon as Stephen's sermon ended, he had a vision, which was an indication that he could see with the eyes of the heart. He said, I, have, I see the heavens opened right now. I'm looking at it. And I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Hearing Stephen say that he could see such things was just too much for them. They stoned him. And Stephen faced his death, perhaps you noticed this, very much in the same way that our Lord did. He prayed to God. He asked for God's forgiveness for those hurting him. And he commended his spirit to the Lord. And Luke adds this. He tells us that a man named Saul stood by approving of their actions. So now we transition to this figure, Saul. Saul was a Pharisee, as he tells us in the book of Philippians. He was incredibly knowledgeable. He had all the right pedigrees when it came to religious authority, yet he could not see. He could not see. And to further illustrate this story, as it unfolds, let's look what happens next to Saul according to the book of Acts. Luke tells us, meanwhile, 
Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Just to stop there for a moment. This is our patron of this parish, St. Paul the Apostle of the Gentiles, but this is how he started out, breathing murderous threats against the disciples. Think about that the next time you invite someone to St. Paul's church. <laughs> this is the person this church is named after, and it's a sign of the incredible transformational power of the gospel in a figure so long ago, and it's the same power that continues to transform lives. <clears throat> we go on. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that's what Christians were first called, people of the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. All the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. A man named Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sights and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. We're baptizing two people after the 1030 service today, by the way, and two people next Sunday. This is a great time to talk about being baptized, about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was Saul's testimony. He was baptized. And as we compare Stephen and Saul before his conversion, we are reminded, as one once said, it is the saints who keeps their head up in the heavens, while it is the unbeliever who insists upon fitting the heavens into their head. Knowledge is not enough. We need vision. We need sight to see God as God really is. And our lens is Jesus. You want to see God? Look to Jesus. Again, Jesus' words, if you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Again, what does this tell us? We begin with knowing Jesus. And he becomes the lens by which we see God. And knowing Jesus is a lifetime adventure. It can be sudden for some of us, like Saul's experience, often born out of pain and struggle. For others, it's a process. For some, it's a combination. Either way, knowing Jesus more and more involves worshiping, studying, and serving. And the gift of sight is a work of God. It's entirely a work of God. And our scriptures tell us that it's possible by being filled with the Holy Spirit. As Paul, formerly known as Saul, would later express when it came to vision, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Do you hear that? Can we see it? That the riches of God's glorious inheritance is seen in his holy people now. This is to say when we behold one another, we know what we know, that we are made in God's image and destined for glory. I hope we know that. But can we see each other as God's holy people? Ordinary, perhaps, in outward appearance, but extraordinary in future hope. Allow me to illustrate it for you. I'll look to C.S. Lewis, who once said that if we could see the person sitting next to us now, as they will one day be, we would likely want to fall down and give them worship. 
He writes further about what we will one day be and how we should see each other now as a reflection of God's glory. There's another portion of his writing from his work, The Weight of Glory. It is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Next to the Blessed Sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Let's think about that. What is he saying? We are surrounded by royalty already coronated by God. You're in the midst of kings and queens of heaven. Right next to you. We should know this. Can we see this? What we should do is treat one another with holy awe. A sign that we truly see what the king of all creation has made the riches of our glorious inheritance revealed even now in one another. How might we live differently if we truly saw this each and every moment? I close with this. From 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, and that's how we should always refer to each other, both with our lips and in our hearts. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. As God is, so are you. Glorious, brilliant, full of love, worthy. Worthy. You and the lives surrounding you are treasures in Christ. May we be filled with the Holy Spirit right now. And not just know this, but truly see. Amen.